subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Discuss the uh, discuss journalism and the debate pressures facing journalism and journalists, especially the context of disinformation campaigns and the impact it has had on journalism and journalists across the world. To do that, we have two fascinating, globally renowned journalists to lead this conversation. Bill Emmett, former editor-in-chief of The Economist and chairman of the trustees at the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. And we also have Shekhar Gupta, founder and editor of The Print, one of India's most respected voices in journalism, who's seen over the last four decades several momentous events in this country from close quarters. Thank you, too, for joining us. And uh, just to outline the format for all our viewers who will be joining us on this broadcast, which is telecast both on our website and on YouTube, uh, we'll have specialists. Our main speakers will outline their thoughts at the start of the program, and then we'll have uh, questions raised to them, observations made, along with me from the special guests who will be joining us this evening, Tim Witcher, uh, South Asia Director of AFP, Dr. Maria Nikitan Kova, Head of Institute for US and Canada Studies at the Russian Academy of Sciences, and my old colleague and friend, Dr. Kishale Bhattacharji, Vice Dean at the OP Jindal School of Journalism. We'll also have Toby Simon, Founder President of the Sanajia Foundation, join us. Those of you viewing this broadcast who'd like to pose questions to the speakers or the panelists, uh, do write in to us at r at sanajiafoundation.in. If we have time, we'll try and take those questions from you as well. So without any further delay, Bill Emmert, why don't you start off by leading the way in this conversation on, on, on the troubles that journalism and journalists face in this world where disinformation campaigns tends to bombard us at enormous speed. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you to the Synergia Foundation for um, hosting us. And I'm delighted and honored to be alongside Sheka Gupta um, in addressing this question. Um, journalism in this disinformation pandemic. Well, I think the first thing one has to say is there's nothing new under the sun. Basically, there's no change in humankind's willingness to tell lies nor to believe lies. The evidence of all our history is that lies and disinformation have always been with us, are very powerful factors. It's no surprise that um, when we journalists write about this subject, we very often dig up the same old quotes because these are eternal issues. And one of the quotes we always dig up is this, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth can even get its boots on. That is variously attributed to Winston Churchill, to Mark Twain, probably all sorts of uh, other people. Um, and the reason is because this issue is an eternal one. So our basic question, I think, today is why do we worry so much now? What is it um, as journalists and as citizens that should worry us today about this disinformation pandemic? in any way special from the past. The basic journalistic question we always ask when we're covering our su any subject, what is really different and why does it matter? Well, I think, first of all, as citizens, I would say that the answer to that question is that currently disinformation is being turbocharged. Turbocharged thanks to the digital revolution, thanks to social media, thanks to the ubiquity of smartphones. It's more powerful in its ability to get around the world before the truth has got its boots on um, more rapidly uh, and to sow greater doubt. Second, this is significant today because it threatens to destroy or at least perhaps neutralize our biggest opportunity in this 21st century namely the progress of science, of technology, of communication, it may harm our ability to deal with the biggest problems that we face using that science, technology, and communication, including pandemics like the COVID-19 pandemic, poverty, climate change above all, and conflict. We should be benefiting from the technological, from the information revolution, and the disinformation pandemic is threatening to create an opportunity cost, a, uh, a limit to the amount of progress that this can bring us. 
And third, I think disinformation threatens the essence of democracy. The essence of democracy is trust, accountability, equality of citizenship. And that is threatened, thrown into doubt by disinformation campaigns, and especially by the doubt that those disinformation campaigns sow in the minds of citizens, which in turn put strength into authoritarian leaders, actual dictators, but also author authoritarian figures inside democracies. So that's why we should worry as citizens. As journalists, we have, I think, related but different worries. The first is a worry or a factor that is a correlation to the disinformation pandemic. It's not caused by it. It is, of course, as we journalists are very familiar, that digitalization, the internet revolution, has destroyed our old business model um, of advertising-led uh, financing of journalism. That old business model is now dead, and that has put into question the financing of certain forms of journalism and, and therefore of truth-telling, particularly at a local newspaper and local television uh, media level, but also to some degree worldwide. I think we're in a transition period in that, fa in that fact, um, and the success of uh, outfits like The Print tells us that uh, the transition is ap absolutely ga galloping ahead. Um, and so I think we journalists make too much fuss about this change of our business model, but nevertheless, it has had some effect on this disinformation uh, pandemic. Second, we should worry as journalists or be interested as journalists because actually the disinformation pandemic makes us more important. And of course, we like being more important. It makes journalists more important as truth tellers, as agents of accountability, as counteractors against the disinformation pandemic. It makes us more important. Once with the digital information, people fantasized about citizen journalism destroying the need for journalism. Actually, the opposite is happening. We're becoming more important, more crucial, um, because precisely of the doubt that is being sowed. So what finally do journalists need to do? And what are we doing in response to this disinformation pandemic? Well, in many ways, the answer is simple. Journalists and their publications have three assets, reputation, reputation, and reputation. We have to build a reputation for independence, for credibility, for accuracy. All that we do and all that makes us survive and hopefully flourish in the future depends on that. I think that the difference now between the strength and the value of genuinely independent publishers, genuinely independent publications, genuinely independent journalists has now been enhanced by this disinformation pandemic. The belief that your information is biased by financial interests, by political interests, by any kind of interests is absolutely deadly to uh, the value adding proposition that we journalists depend upon. So I think independence has become a far more important factor. Second, going back to the business model, the great thing about today's era is that the subscription model is now becoming king. Netflix have show, has shown that it's king in broadcasting, in television. And this is very much to our advantage as journalists. The role of advertisers, of sponsors, is basically a corrupting, parasitical uh, influence on um, the truth-telling, uh, the journalism, the credibility that we all depend upon. Subscription has the great merit of focusing journalists and their editors on what should always be the fundamental question. What value am I adding for the reader or viewer? Why should somebody pay for what I've just provided? Why should they believe what I've told them? And I think the subscription model is very, very powerful for that. Finally, what we should do, though, is that we are in a business of competing with social media platforms. They are what has destroyed our business model, but they are also a big part of the disinformation pandemic. 
I believe there is one issue on which journalists and publishers must and should campaign, and that is for regulations worldwide, but always at national level, but coordinated worldwide, ensuring that social media platforms have the same level of responsibility for what is published on their platforms as we as publishers, as we as broadcasters have had for years. There is no way to eliminate lies or to eliminate disinformation, but by giving the responsibility to the producers, the publishers of that uh, information, we have an ability to limit, to mitigate, to contain that, uh, that, that uh, virus um, that is contaminating our democratic life. It's absolutely vital that the social media platforms of all kinds are absolutely firmly given that responsibility of policing what is what is published on their platforms. They are not just railway tracks, independent of what trains go on them, they are integral to the publishing process. And we must, I think, campaign for that to be put into place. We can contain, if that is happening, this in disinformation pandemic, but most of all, we can compete with it through our truth-telling, through our reputation. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Information. I think you have to be closer to the microphone. I can't. Uh, tell. Uh, you can hear me now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's a bit better. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, a very, very important point that you were making towards the end about the responsibility of social media platforms. I'll also take up the issue of social media platforms trying to campaign for revenue of of news organizations and the technology aspects as well as we go along. But now, Shaker, would you like to add or share your thoughts on this matter first? Well. Uh, I think this panel is all wrong because it's all wrong for uh, what would be prime time TV <laughs> because this will get no ratings because when you, when you have panelists all agree with each other, you are guaranteed to have no readings. By this time, I should have, um, I should be believe, I should be sort of dying to throw stuff at Bill. On the other hand, I have to agree with him on uh, every point. So let me just make it like a relay race and pick up the baton from him. Now, uh, very good, very important point he made about citizen journalism. Now, when I saw this idea emerge uh, about 15 years ago, I called it a pestilence. And at that time, this idea had a lot of sex appeal. This was a great liberal idea uh, that anybody with a smartphone could be a journalist. Effectively, what it also meant for me, uh, our parochial interest was very important. That would mean that journalists are not needed. So uh, I thought of a line at some point and I use it all the time. And I think that line has stood the test of time. And I then said that when you start going to citizen doctors and start hiring citizen lawyers, I will give you citizen journalists. Because citizen journalists, the idea is disrespectful of the profession and trade and the craft of journalism. It somehow gives the impression or makes a presumption that anybody who sees something can be a journalist. But the fact is that that's how a lot of our fake news comes. Because, and we see all the time, we see all the time people posting videos, people posting, uh, uh, posting just what well, such as a building is on fire. Nobody's could have survived inside. Good point. Nobody could have survived inside, but who will find out how many people were there inside? Or was there anybody inside? And that lie would go around the world before forget, forget uh, truth getting its boots, boots on. Even when truth gets its boots on, then the other propaganda will start that, oh, you must be hiding it. You are covering up for somebody. This has to have happened this way. So many people would have died of COVID. You know, this vaccine went wrong. Uh, two cases in Europe of some clots being formed. By the time you find that mainstream, respectable, respected media, and when you say respected, this is not an entitlement. You don't say that because I'm the New York Times, the Economist, the print. Uh, Gupta, Keshalim Bhattacharya, we are respectable, or uh, Maria, we are not respecting because of that. We are respectable because we built reputations over time. 
and those reputations are built both on successes and failures and on what we get right and what we occasionally get wrong obviously if you got it wrong more often than uh, we got it right then there will be no reputation but if you get it right 98 times and get it wrong two times you get a good reputation 98% strike rate is very good and since most of us know cricket i mean even don bradman did not bat at 90 uh, just at 99% did not bat at 100% but again further reputations will be determined on who is willing to accept the two times out of 100 that she went wrong because once you accept that sorry i put my hand up we got it wrong we are correcting it that enhances your reputation you don't get that on with citizen journalism you don't get that with social media you don't get that with any of this fly by night uh, operations you get that with institutions and that's how news media institutions take a long time building now you see what's happening at the other end a lot of people don't like it and this is not people on the left or the right people on any side do not like credible media institutions so credible media institutions have been given another name which is now used as a pejorative which is mainstream media uh, msn how do you trust the mainstream media so mainstream media again is the economist ft new york times washington post cnn the print the indian express the hindu uh, the times of india because unless you delegitimize them unless you delegitimize them the market for fake news cannot prosper forget prospering it cannot survive so we are now a big threat to the myth, to the fake news market now fake news market there is a big vested interest in this and that doesn't come from a few guys who might be selling some fake snake oil uh, on youtube videos or treatment for this or treatment for that those are those are small fry this matters to political leaders corporate leaders the bad guys on all sides because they have to delegitimize and dis- disintermediate us what they do is and we see this in india india as well donald trump did this in the us and narendra modi does it in india and now we find more and more of our chief ministers are doing because when they talk to people like us i mean when they talk to journalists from organizations like ours who are trained to be journalists who are trained to ask questions who are trained to be skeptical who are trained to fact check uh, who start uh, googling the moment you make a claim even while they are talking with you bit impertinent but they do that so they now they have now figured that they, it is possible to cut us out of the loop because they think i can use social media and talk to my constituents directly and today's politics is such that for every leader all that matters is my base for boris johnson his base matters the rest can go to hell for narendra modi his base matters the rest can go to hell in any case we are not going to vote for him so why should we talk with him so this whole idea in politics governance especially in democracies non democracies you had no expectations that whole idea that public office is public trust and once you are holding a public office in public trust you have to do something for everybody that whether they vote for you or not that idea is gone once that idea is gone then you don't like fair credible press which is institutions where if you kill one guy the institution will not collapse where you have one editor fired the institution will not collapse and that is what they don't like so this is now seen as a big threat and this is seen by lots of others who need the power of propaganda these can be religious groups these can be anti vaxxer groups <clears throat> these can be anti gmo or pro gmo groups or anti science groups of anybody and that is where uh, we find that bill talked about uh, the economic models the where the economic models bring a problem is that increasingly uh institutions of mainstream media for want of another word are getting weakened across the world now you might say that look why should this be uh, just a uh, just in the control of five or six organizations you can say that but those five or six organizations have invested generations of goodwill and, gener- and taken risks over generations 
you can destroy their credibility that's one thing but once their economics begins to get crippled then bigger problems arise then the organization's ability to spend money journalistic salary they are down in many places most places layoffs uh, can you invest in such and such coverage uh, so increasingly you have to make those calls now bill talked about subscription it's a great model and we are not behind a paywall but we make subscription appeal so we get some amount of voluntary subscriptions and we can give them some benefits like newsletters and all but we know that if you really wanted to build everything primarily based on subscriptions it will be very difficult then for us to be doing what we are hoping to do but what is our mission statement that is de hyphenated journalism but neither left nor right now what is and it's difficult to explain to people that you know what is de hyphenated is not neutral it doesn't mean that we don't have a view on anything we have a view on everything it's just that looking at us you can't immediately guess what our view will be on something because we are not hyphenated so if you want to depend on subscriptions you also need to be hyphenated and you've seen this problem uh, now frequently with the new york times for example some of the polls they have taken and i think they are sort of driving more and more nails into their gleaming coffin uh, whether it's uh, getting rid of their op-ed page editor or is number 2 or now this uh, this health correspondent uh, what's his name i forget forget the name mcneil uh, mcneil because he used the n word 3 years ago uh, while accompanying a group of uh, students uh, teenage students all this tells you that there is now institutional concern that my subscribers also have an expectation of me and that expectation is not de hyphenated journalism and that is a challenge that all of us face now because our readers will definitely give us money if they think that we are serving a purpose but readers also now tend to define or viewers tend to define their purpose in terms of what is useful for them in the short run it's then much more useful to be aligned one side or the other not to do fake news now fake news uh, we can discuss more and i will stop here but i'll tell you that there are two kinds of fake news one is completely fake news something that never happened so uh, in india for example uh, oh uh, such and such person who is in your security establishment he was an undercover agent he spent 15 years of his youth undercover in pakistan fantastic guy but he never did so right uh, because he was somebody who was a <laughs> member of the indian police service and we know exactly when he was where and some of us have known him for 40 years but that is a completely fake news now for 10 years now wherever i go to speak because i speak about uh, national security affairs etc i must a question but you know so and so he was uh, an undercover agent that's a complete lie but there are also there is also news which is in a sense correct but you can put put an angle to it for example somebody might have said made a statement in a certain context you take out a context but before the person starts correcting it's too late because everybody wants right. what they believe you might have said so these are areas where i know digital media has given us a lot of power and we can also move in quickly but digital media is also not giving us a very healthy economics so generally in the news media and our salaries have to correct on the downside uh, our editorial expenses will have to correct on the downside so these are real problems that we have going ahead right uh quickly just, quickly, just, just to, to just to, just to make, make it a little, little interesting, interesting because, because you started, started by, by saying, saying that if we all agree we are not, not going to really have an interesting conversation and i play the devil's advocate and i want to ask you this question given that both of you have been at the helm of uh, international organizations over the last four decades how much is it the responsibility of an institutional failure to create public spirited journalism over the many years that we are we are in the situation that we are in today uh, can you track the genesis of how we got here uh, is it recent or is it does it date back 
um, uh, you know, to the 70s. Bill? You go first, Shekha. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have an, what might be an unconventional view. Uh, I don't think public spirited journalism works. I will not say it doesn't work, but it cannot replace commercially funded journalism that pays for itself. Good journalism must earn its living. So I am unwilling to accept that there is a contradiction between good journalism and the marketplace. And I think uh, things do settle down. I mean, I may have mentioned a few things, few challenges that, say, an organization like the NYT has had. But essentially, their subscriptions are now paying for a lot of salaries, as are FTs, as increasingly are ours. And we are just three years old yet uh, and unhyphenated. So these are consumers who are paying. This is not public spirited journalism in that sense. Now, Guardian is a good example of a kind of public spirited journalism. But I know what Guardian's view will be on almost anything. Uh, if India wins the Cricket World Cup, it's a true story in 2011 in Mumbai. The Guardian intro would be in a country where two thirds of the people go to sleep on an empty stomach. Uh, cricket is this great uh, cause for celebration. And today they beat so and so to become world champions. So that is, you may call it public spirited. I also call it hyphenated. So foundation funded journalism for me uh, is not something that I like, uh, particularly when foundations have expectations. Because just as corporates have expectations, politicians have expectations, real estate tycoons have expectations, foundations also have expectations. If a found foundation gives you a certain amount of money to cover a certain kind of story, to cover a story in Congo, they want a certain kind of story. What if a reporter comes back saying that is not the story? I'll just chip in to say, I think on, on um, public service journalism, maybe it's worth saying a thing or two. I mean, obviously I'm in a, in a British context. I think that the big question is about public service broadcasting, which after all is a pretty rare creature worldwide in terms of really genuinely independent public service broadcasting. I mean, the BBC has a, has a heritage that's a rather different one from most public broad service broadcasters um, in nations in Europe or anywhere, and certainly in the United States and, and, and elsewhere. But one thing that has changed there is that um, the centrality of the BBC and of that public service broadcasting has declined because of the the growth of uh, of other television and the competition from other television the fragmentation of viewing habits that means that the kind of the anchor role of that sort of public service broadcaster um if you like telling people the, the as it were a central set of realities um has um, gone away but i don't think that's their fault exactly um they've dealt with it sometimes badly and sometimes well but they're basically it's it's thanks to the information and communications revolution if we should criticize like the mainstream media as shakar said it can be sometimes that we are insufficiently critical of the establishment um that uh, that what is death i think for the mainstream media is becoming connected to the establishment we have to be critics of the establishment even if we are close to it for our information reasons and at times the the mainstream media has become um perhaps a little blind to some of the sins of the establishment and that is where i think some criticism can be legitimately um parlayed I will I will take another question on whether this this present reality is a result of disenchantment with the mainstream media at the next stage. But uh, Tim Witcher, would you like to pose an observation or uh, make a question to the make an observation or pose a question to the speakers? Sure. Um, I think Bill is very right that the lie, all this lies and disinformation is nothing new. I mean, if you go back to Joseph Goebbels, he'd be having a ball today if he was around on social media. I mean, he only had radio. If he had Twitter and TikTok and all the rest of it, he'd be like a pig in mud today, really. So I think we're, what we have to do is, in, like, you know, to go back to the cricket similes that people have been using as well, when Virat Kohli lost this week, 
because he lost the toss. He said, well, you know what? You've got to embrace the state of the wicked and you've got to adjust to those conditions. And journalism has got to adjust to those conditions now. So like at AFP, we've set up a fact-checking service and we have fact-checkers in more than 35 countries now that will grow a lot over the next year. So, you know, it's, it's a growth area for us because I think independent media and even state media recognise that they need some fact-checking now to help us kind of bolster confidence in the news. So we've got to embrace the change and we've got to adapt to it. And it could be through fact-checking and uh, training and things like that. But really, one of the fundamental points we have to find now, on top of the subscription service, and that concerns me less as a, as a news agency journalist, so that I de we depend on your goodwill as well. Uh, but how, how are we going to train the future generations of journalists so that they know the importance of the source and how to mistrust the disinformation that governments try to put out? And that's, for me, as an old timer now, is, is really a fundamental thing because I see so many young journalists coming in and, and it takes us a while to train them to do that. Very clever, very clever people, but they can't see a source. They cannot see the source of the story. So I'd like to hear what Bill and uh, Shekhar this veteran journalist, think about that. How are we going to train the next generation? Or even yeah, readers, how, how are we going to train and create a next generation of journalists who can practice what you call dehyphenated journalism, which is fact-based? Well, it is tough because you know, there was always generation gap in newsrooms between the editors and the reporters. But now in these times, uh, what used to be a 25 year period for a generation gap is now about seven years. So I'm now hiring people who are, who are about seven genera five generations ahead of me. So the attention spans are short. Uh, also, we demand too much patience. We demand too much patience, too much check, too much checking, uh, too much this, too much that. So it is tough. It is tough, but you know, uh, you've got to keep working at it. And the truth is that uh, whether we like it or not, uh, we still have, we, we are, editors are required to be even tougher SOBs in the newsrooms now. To say that uh, you may have, uh, somebody has stung somebody and you have this take you still have to call the person who's been stung. And the reporters routinely say, but you know, I have the tape, why do I have to ask? Because reporters don't feel, they feel awkward calling somebody and giving them the bad news. They'd rather do guerrilla journalism, which means publish it, and next day we'll see what happens. And you say, no, but you must call. That is journalism. If there are consequences, pressure comes, we are there to deal with it. But you find that a lot of the newer organizations in particular, they, they think this is cowardice and they think uh, once you get something on camera, on tape, something, just go with it. So to say that in any situation, the other side must get a hearing and then you run into the argument over both sidism. Uh, it's like somebody said that, you know, you say all this stuff about Narendra Modi uh, and you write these uh, long articles and give long speeches and etc cetera, etc cetera. but you've never called him a fascist just call him a fascist and i said look my weekly column national interest is 1200 words uh, if i call somebody a fascist i'll say so and so is a fascist that is five words so what do i write in the remaining 1195 words uh, so and that is something something that you have to deal with right. all the time in your newsrooms now now, somebody made a factual error, I will, about a certain story uh, that so and so set up a Twitter handle uh, against a so called love jihad. Love jihad is this uh, concept whereby it seems that Muslim boys uh, entrap Hindu women to get them married to them and with the intention of not marrying them but converting them to Islam. So somebody said that so-and-so set up this handle. The person said, but I never set up, set up this handle. Please show me. And we found out she had never set up that handle. So we asked the reporter that, you know, you said that she set up the handle. It's easy to check. Why didn't you check? He said, but this is the ideology. If she didn't set it up, she would have set it up. So, uh, and we had to tell that young person to go. 
and i know that my newsroom was very sullen over that for a long time because they thought but those guys are fascists they do these things this is their view but she didn't do it so this is where i think we have to keep uh, keep fighting and people do figure out in the course of time uh, that uh, that a balance comes in that once people know that you don't have a motive you don't have an agenda you get they get good news from you sometimes they get bad news from sometimes from you sometimes now it it is challenging much more challenge challenging than used to it used to be also uh, we were i'd like to say that we were much more, much more obedient and god and god fearing as young reporters than today's young journalists would be but that's that's how uh, how uh, generations change in fact when we became reporters our editors would say are we never got a byline till we were 50 years old I mean, they they were not working at the economist uh, but uh, but times change and i think it's it uh, and I th- at the same time i think people like us people of our generation owe it to journalism not to get fed up and tired and say everything is messed up go to hell i'll go home i'll write a book i'll give gyan from campus to campus here to there i think we owe it to ourselves to to stick yeah. it out in mainstream journalism because yeah. journalism, journalism has given us a lot uh, this is the payback time you're not being very popular with your young digital newsroom i see with the comments that you made about how you see them but bill uh, how do you think we prepare a future generation of journalists to ensure that they can fight the disinformation pandemic well i i think uh, tim has got it absolutely right we have to embrace the change we have to you know as as the world has changed we have to embrace it and that requires actually much more investment of time in training uh than was ever the case um when uh, shakar and i in, in, entered journalism it was you know here's a typewriter or here's a tele here's a here's a share of a telephone <laughs> um, <laughs> um, go and find a story and then and and then we'll publish it so uh, and uh, much journalism is still about hands on training about learning on the job but nevertheless i think training has become more important the worst tension in journalism is between speed and standards however we have to acknowledge that and uh, as uh, as editors as as uh, managers we have to con- w- find ways to control that the urge to publish instantly which obviously is something that um, a news agency knows much more <laughs> about than uh, than uh, an old weekly hack like me um uh, is is probably the biggest enemy of standards and of of training and uh, the the mixture of the of instant publishing with um if you like clickbait um incentivizing measures met- metrics for uh, rewarding and uh, and and uh, evaluating journalists based on the instant response to their to their stories is also a dangerous factor and we have to lean against it um uh, as uh, as editors and there is but in this situation of course there's the question of where's the money coming from how do you spend where's the money to spend on on uh, training where are the sub editors uh, i'm delighted to hear that you've got a lot more fact checkers because that shows that afp is investing money in uh, in enforcing standards and ensuring standards we've got to be high less standards than ever before um uh, frankly um and well, it costs uh, money that's true and if you ask me uh, the best training school for journalists is the newsroom and newsroom the professors in the newsroom are the middle management which is the editors at various levels now what's happened is that because of uh, the financial challenges you've seen a decimation of middle management in newsrooms across the world now chief editors don't have so much time plus they have to control the environment they have to they do whatever they do but you need that bunch of mid, middle management editors who kept sanity in the newsroom who were also who are also selfless who work on reporters copy don't take a byline take pride in making that copy shine and then reporters in the course of time figure out that these are the ones that matter for me uh, some solution for them some issues what uh, uh what the policy how to find the special message uh, from the cover of the issue in the 
the Economist uh, magazine cover or in in another print magazines. Thank you. Well, thank you. Shall I answer that question first? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, I think the question that one should have in one's mind as well is whether or not as an old uh, editor of The Economist, I'm, I'm a dinosaur because um, the, uh, the value and, and importance of the cover in my time as editor was in, inherently connected to the status of the publication as a print publication, as a physical object. Uh, and so the, the cover image was the single powerful, most powerful way to convey an idea to convey an idea of the story, to convey an idea of uh, the the analysis of the of the uh, argument that uh, the publication, the Economist, is making, and therefore also to give an impression to the to the to the reader, an active reader or a potential reader of what is the point of view and the tone of voice and the attitude of this uh, publication. The the single best way to do that is through the cover and therefore the decision making process was basic is always and has always has been absolutely in the hands of the editor in chief themselves obviously mm -hmm. with a staff um, around them who are artists and uh, interpreters if you like of ideas um, and who are deliberately made close to the editorial discussion so that they understand exactly the issue and the point of view and then they produce proposals for how it should be conveyed um, in the cover and but ultimately the decision was always the, the, the decision made by the editor-in-chief so when I was doing that job it was my, absolutely my responsibility but in the digital world the cover has a different uh, value and a different uh, different status in terms of tempting people uh, into uh, to read and also in terms of conveying uh, the image of the publication. So probably you'd have to ask my successor, uh, the current successor, Zanny um, uh how is she thinking about this? I think she's probably a hybrid uh, in this in that um, The Economist is still a pr importantly print publication, but also most widely read on uh, on tablets, on iPads and uh, mobile devices. And then the cover is remains a powerful way to convey the image and the idea, but it is different from in print. Uh, I suspect in 10 years time, it will have an, uh, yet another uh, centrality or sense, sense to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got a bit of an echo here. Uh, three quick questions to both. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to both Shekhar and Bill, uh, three quick questions. You know, the, I'm sure uh, the panelists know, but for the audience, you know, there is, a, there is a fine difference between misinformation and disinformation. I mean, disinformation is when you are doing it intentionally. Misinformation is a, is a lie that's kind of done unintentionally, though the impact and effect could be the same. But the classic case, I think, of disinformation and misinformation both combined uh, in the exactly one year back. And, you know, it gives almost a circular sense of time to me because it was uh, last year around this time that in Delhi's, uh, you know, uh, Nizamuddin where the Tablighi uh, case broke. And, you know, the media went you know, into a frenzy almost. Sorry, I've had a power cut, but the power will be back. So just but the audio is uh, anyway uh, audible to you. So, <laughs> so you know, uh, the, the, the frenzy with which the media reported the tablighi, unfortunately, when the case was, you know, resolved and now they're police cases, and, you know, they have been let out or let off. The media did not really follow it up. So in a sense, Bill, what I'm saying is that the media has always been guilty of framing the agenda. Uh, we have framed agenda uh, in, in various ways. For example, what's happening in Myanmar? Myanmar, next door to India, is staring at an abyss and there is zero coverage of Myanmar happening from India which is also, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know in a form, it's disinformation because we are not really giving them that our responsibility is to be able to inform the job of the journalist. Journalism is a service industry. Our service is to provide information. 
I mean, how much information have we really provided? I know our resources were meager. Uh, the organization that I worked for was one of the largest networks in, in India, and yet our resources were very meager. At one point, I was covering 12 states in India, which was impossible to do. I mean, you know, uh, even for even not, I was uh, infinitely more talented than I am. I couldn't have covered that area. The second is that I wanted to ask is that when facts itself is not available, how do you fact check? And again, the Tablighi case presents the same scenario. I mean, we were not very sure of what was happening. So how do you cross check facts when the facts themselves are not uh, available to us? And thirdly, of course, how do you fact check? Uh, and Tim also can come in here at the pace of the social media. I mean, you know, every millisecond, some news is breaking on Twitter. How do I fact check and counter that if I, as journalists, I'm supposed to be counterpoised, as uh, Bill said, that, you know, that our, our role has become even more important today. But how do we deliver that, the, the goods really that, is, that has come to us? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll rest my case here with the three questions. You've raised three questions. Uh, 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 who wants to go first? Um, you want to check the first question, and I thought the most pertinent, pertinent is how do you fact check when facts are not available? Who is the torchbearer of facts? Who's supposed to provide you the facts? Well, that's, I mean, that's been a sort of, uh, we had a worked example of that around the coronavirus pandemic, basically, where um, the facts aren't available. I mean, they're emerging bit by bit. We're groping our way towards an understanding of it. And uh, the most misleading phrase um, that has often been used by decision makers has been the phrase, follow the science. Because um, you can't do that because the science isn't there. It's emerging. It's gradually emerging as data comes out, as evidence is produced and so forth. So I think the most vital thing as, as writers, as narrators for this, uh, this uh, play is to be honest about what is, avail what is known and what isn't known. We have to be clear to our readers as a part of our service about what is available and what isn't available. Uh, and the, and portray accurately, as accurately as we can, the level of uncertainty. Uh, and I, I think at times during the coronavirus pandemic, that has been one of the biggest failings of, of media, um, wanting to jump onto a fact and turn it into, a, into an enlightenment rather than simply a clue. Um, and we should be looking at uh, an emerging situation in that way. But, but I mean, the journalistic principle is, is, is be honest about it. Um, maybe I'll, I mean, the, the next question I'll answer is about the how do you deal with fact checking with the pace of social media? Um, I mean, I, fortunately, I'm not Mark Zuckerberg. I don't need to worry about uh, the, the, that uh, as such. Um, I need to worry in the same way as Tim Witcher's AFP worries or, or um, the print worries or the Economist Today worries. And that is to make sure that the facts in what I publish are correct. Um, and when and then to have an eye out for when social media facts are are uh, contaminators or challenges of those facts. But I think the principal purpose of fact checking is to raise the credibility of what we do. Um, I always thought, and this is just basic to um, a publication in, in busy times, I always thought the basic competition for The Economist was not Time Magazine with a capital T, it was the time of our readers. Do they have time to find out things? Do they have time to read The Economist? And basically, the service that we can offer, I mean, that publications can offer, is to save them, readers, the time of trying to work out what's right and what's wrong on social media. If you just read the print, then they have to believe actually this will cut through the nonsense on social media and mean that I don't have to worry about what's right and wrong because Shekhar will have done the job for me um, or AFP. Uh, and that's basically the way we have to approach it. We can't, we can't go chasing every, every, every damn lie on social media. That's Mark Zuckerberg's job. <laughs> well, also, not, not everything you publish at the deadline time is definitive and the final truth. You no. go with the facts that you have because stories develop and stories change. Uh, one day you might say, I mean, COVID, herd immunity is 20% people, 30% people, 80% people, 90% people. Then Manaus in Brazil keeps on right. getting more waves. So you go with the facts and the 
and the understanding that you have but at the same time always have the humility to say that this is all we have this doesn't mean that this cannot change right. so you go with the facts you can check and if there are facts you cannot check be willing to risk losing that story in fact that's uh, bill would tell you or anybody who's run a newsroom would tell you that is the biggest struggle to tell reporters that look you think you have a fantastic news break i also think you have a fantastic news break but there may be one in a thousand chance that this is wrong and the person will say no because nobody wants to fact check their way out of a story that looks too good to be untrue and you know you keep on telling them this story is too good to be untrue so apply that test and sometimes we might have held back a story and the odd time uh, i might have i might have failed to do it and regretted it so these are lessons you learn as you go along shekhar that's why that's why you need experienced people uh, who've taken it on the chin a few times so i think social media doesn't worry me because social media actually gives you an advantage as well it takes it gives you for uh, earlier if an if uh, the economist made a factual error which it rarely does but suppose it made a bad error it would take a week for it to rectify you will have to wait for the next issue today even if it's in my print edition i can rectify it the next minute uh so there is that 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 gift the sp- speed becomes a curse but the speed is also a gift but the damage to the error causes is also exponentially faster given the technology that happens uh, but uh, leave that be that as it may i want to take the other question that kishale raised uh, shekhar you started off with your argument against foundation sponsored journalism or foundation funded journalism in that sense where do you find the resources then given that the market is not generating enough resources where do you find the resources for good journalism because all of this that we've spoken about requires enormous amount of economic uh, economic muscle given that the disinformation is being peddled by those with enormous economic uh, might well i'm not saying find foundations don't matter uh, there are foundations and foundations there are good foundations so but there are not many foundations that will give you money in an unhyphenated manner we also get some help some help it's a fraction of our needs from ipsmf which is the uh, uh, indian public spirited uh, media foundation independent and public spirited media foundation so we get for example help from them uh, for part of our science coverage because if we didn't have that help then as a new organization we would not invest in science coverage now we have a science section which is a very powerful science section i am pleasantly surprised it read it's read a great deal right. it's a usp but we would not have been able to do it if we did not have some support uh, it's not as if it only runs on ipsmf support similarly we get some support for covering right. some far away regions of the country but that is a support so all i'm saying is that it's difficult to run full journalistic institutions or full operations purely on foundation funding because foundations are also subject to vagaries of the market stock markets go down foundations suddenly stop getting their funds uh, so you have to get people real stakeholders are the audiences you have to find a way to get them to pay because once they pay for your journalism then they become free loaders so i say to people all the time although we are not behind a paywall but i make one appeal usually in a month and i say i am not appealing to a sense of philanthropy or charity please don't gift us anything but if the journalism we do is of value to you uh, then you pay for it so i am appealing to your sense of self respect right. not your sense of philanthropy because what you get free may not be so good for you right uh, and i find that this is i mean i wish uh, about if about three times as many people listen to me as they do right now will be okay <laughs> but uh, but we are only 3 years old right and and i and, and i can't do charity with time right now because we are out of time now it's uh, it's or or, or towards the end of it toby would you like to come up with uh, would you like to share your thoughts your observations 
thank you very much, Veer. I will take a pass. I think it has been well explained by all the speakers here, and we are at six thirty now. So uh, I will just give it back to you, Veer, to just conclude it. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Toby. Uh, my last question to you, Bill. Uh, I'm just going to indulge you for the last uh, five extra minutes on this. Uh, you started off with the idea of social media and and the fact that they need to be made responsible uh, for what they carry uh, in terms of information and fact checking as well. Do you believe that the future of journalism would 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 rely entirely on these agencies that we're talking about, which are which are today a threat to journalism, as some would say? These large tech companies will eventually be the ones who will control journalism. Do you see that uh, eventually happening in the next few years? Or do you believe that the mainstream news organizations and the old world journalism uh, institutions are the ones that are going to be the torchbearers of truth? Well, I, I think that there's going to be um, a, a great multiplicity of, uh, of bearers of truth. I think that uh, the opportunity in uh, the digital world to uh, achieve subscription income is there. Um, the ability to uh, to uh, operate on uh, relatively economical ways are, are there too. Um, the big thing I'm worried about is the imbalance of responsibility that we have uh, legally um, with, uh, with uh, the tech platforms. Social media platforms will always be important outlets for journalism of all kinds. Right. If I write something on my Substack newsletter, something that is free, but I could be a subscription business that I was doing, then I, of course, I, I promote it through Twitter, through LinkedIn, through social media. Of course, I use it and I will always do it. But I want, if people like me do that, I want the, the, um, the, the owners of those social media platforms to be suable on the basis of the libels that I might uh, be delivering or the or the sins that I might be creating or the hate sheet, sheet, uh, right. speech I might be propagating so that they have the same responsibility as Shekhar has when he publishes uh, something, by whoever it's by, um, he can go to prison for it or he can be sued uh, just as I was good as, a, as, a, as an editor. Mm -hmm. And I just think that social media platforms have to bear that responsibility. That doesn't mean they have to fact uh, check every fact. They can't do that. That's impossible. But they should be there. They should be motivated and incentivized to off take some responsibility for for policing what is what it what, what how they are used, what how their platforms are used. And then we are just a more equal uh, um, uh, playing field. Right, yes, I, I'm not only not only fully in agreement with this, but I am somebody who's been at the other end of it. So there was a landmark case, an Indian court, small Indian court, where we sued Google. Uh, and that was about 10 years ago. And somebody was putting out stuff saying Shekhar Gupta deserves a bullet in his bald head uh, <laughs> because of a speech I made in Pakistan. In the speech, I said that problem with you Pakistanis is that your dictatorship is as imperfect as is our democracy. Uh, because Musharraf was in power there and I, and I said, I can still make this speech here that tells you that you don't have a perfect dictatorship. Right. So you equated India with Pakistan, so pull it in your head. And this went on for quite some time. Right. And Google would not give us the IP. And finally, we had an order from a court. Uh, Google refused to respond. There were warrants against uh, Google uh, board members. And finally, they did share it. Uh, so. I absolutely am in sympathy with it because all of us face the full force of all the laws when we publish something. Now, right. a very simple thing, can we publish something anonymously? Maybe once in many years. So we saw this long cable stuff that came out just now on US foreign policy in China that Politico published, uh, I think Atlantic uh, Foundation published, anonymous. But that is once in many years and you give many reasons for it. But on the other hand, the social media platforms publish so much anonymously under fake names. There is no accountability. Right. So if somebody is saying put a bullet in his bald head, at least I need to know the worthy's identity. Hmm. So maybe it is somebody who comes and uh, delivers milk to me every day. Hmm. Or maybe it's somebody uh, who I have lunch with once in three weeks. Fortunately, it was somebody without a gun and just a Twitter handle, I guess. Uh, a Google handle, uh, Shekhar. Uh, but you, you know, um, sorry to cut you short, we're out of time. I'm just going to ask you a one word response. 
you you covered Operation Blue Star. I'm taking you back uh, to uh, 1984. Uh, do you? Uh, this was when the Golden Temple was stormed by Indian troops. Quick answer: Was it, would it have been easier to cover such an event, which was extremely momentous in terms of Indian history, with social media or without social media and the present day internet? Which would have been better? I think would have been easier to cover it today, but would have been much tougher for any government to control the situation uh, as it was done then. There would have been much more bloodshed right. and much more damage today. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Shekhar. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we run completely out of time. Obviously, this conversation uh, needs much more time than just 60 minutes or 65 minutes that we've had. Thank you, Kishile. And what I've learned from this is that before we do fact check, we also need to do a tech check for ourselves, uh, given the problems that we had uh, during this conversation. Thank you, Toby. Thank you, Dr. Maria. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Shekhar and Bill for joining us. And thank you all for uh, joining into this conversation. Do write in to us. We'll try and forward your questions to, the, to our speakers and try and get a response uh, whenever they are free. Thank you so much for joining it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.